In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The predominant theme for today's readings, as you probably guessed, is the healing, that is, salvation of the Gentiles. Actually, sometimes Epiphany is called that, the Christmas of the Gentiles. The season began with the visit of the Magi from afar, and now today, Naaman received not only victory for the Lord and for Syria, but he receives healing at the word of the Lord and his prophet Elisha. St. Paul wrote this to the Church of Rome earlier in today's gospel or epistle reading, making known to them his desire to reap some harvest among them and the rest of the Gentiles. And then, of course, we heard in the gospel of the Roman centurion who was stationed there in Capernaum, who came before Jesus to seek healing for his paralyzed servant. Now, as we are mostly, if not all, Gentiles, quote-unquote, by birth, maybe we have a hard time understanding this focus of the Epiphany season, the focus upon the Gentiles. But I think we can actually understand if we examine ourselves rightly and see that we tend to fall into the same old errors as the Pharisees and Sadducees. But among us, it goes more like this. We are Lutherans by birth. We were brought into the Lutheran church through marriage or by family or through adoption, but we belong here. We deserve to be here. We've earned our place in this pew and nobody can take it from us. But it keeps going really worse yet. Those people don't know what it means to be a member of the Congregation of Sermon Center. They haven't been here with us for eight generations. They can't possibly know what's expected of them as a member here. We have our ways. We have our traditions. They don't know, and they dare not bring into question anything, because how can they know? Either conform or leave. Toe the line or be quiet. You're not alone in this. This exaggerated sense of self-importance, whether it is Jew and Gentile or servant and master, whether it is rich or poor, however that plays out, it always gets in the way of the gospel. So the implicit question in today's text is whether or not Gentiles, those who had been excluded, whether they too can be saved. But by Gentiles today, I would argue that we ought not think just of those who are not Jews, but rather those who are outsiders. Think of the leper, who is an outsider due to his disease. Think of the paralyzed man who can't participate in the life of his community because of his paralysis. Think of the centurion, who, of course, is a Roman soldier. <laughs> How could he believe anything? And the old error that the gospel seeks to correct today in you is thinking of yourself fundamentally different than the them, the other. And this sort of us versus them dichotomy, it's always a distortion, at least according to God's word. It isn't real. There is no us versus them. Or as Paul says, there is no distinction. Remember the word. No distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Your identity as a Christian, then, is not some special status due to you because of your hard effort or the effort of your parents. Actually, it's probably true. Some of you weren't Christians by birth. Actually, none of us are. Not by our heritage and not by any of our good efforts. You are a Christian solely by the work of the Holy Spirit, working through the Word and granting to you as a gift, faith, trust. This Word of God works through the forgiveness of sins declared, salvation in Christ only, preached, 
baptism applied and the Lord's body and blood given and shed and to eat and to drink. That is to say, your identity as Christians, the fact that you're a Christian at all, is because it's been received by you as a gift, passively. So, again, to summarize, you are God's child because he adopted you in holy baptism, not by your creation. You are forgiven because God the Father gave his Son to die for you, not because you've given yourself to Jesus. You stand acquitted before the throne of God because Christ was raised for your justification, not because of all the ways you try to justify yourself. And you are still a Christian because God the Spirit preserves this faith in you through his preaching and teaching, not by your effort or strength. And even, as we heard in the epistle today from Romans 12, your faith for God and your love for one another, that too is a gift as it's renewed regularly and strengthened in you as you receive Christ in his body and blood to eat and to drink. Thus, at the heart of salvation, that is, being a Christian, is that actually everyone, whether insider or outsider, they receive it all. You received it as a gift. Now, you learn this uh, at Reformation time every year. The three solas, remember? Sola Scriptura, Sola Fides, and Sola Gratia. Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. That is to say, you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not your doing, but it is a gift of God, not by works, lest you might boast. You come to receive salvation through God working through his word, the scripture alone. And only by revealing to you what he has done for you in his son Jesus can you be saved. No amount of well wishes, cautious optimism, no amount of calling upon your heritage, no amount of soft-pedaling death and hell can save you. There is salvation in no one else than Jesus Christ. His name alone is the name by which you are saved. So what's most startling for us today in the gospel, then, is this Roman centurion who gets it. He says to Jesus, only say the word and my servant will be healed. There it is. Salvation, healing for his servant in Jesus comes through that sort of trust. The trust that simply by speaking the word, his servant will be healed. The same thing that's done for you. Simply a word spoken to you and you are saved. Through the spirit, through the word, preached and taught. As the centurion understood, but we often don't, Salvation doesn't come from within us. Trust in God doesn't come from within us. Even the new life of the Christian is not our life, but Christ's life lived through us. So by and through his word, God the Holy Spirit causes, outside of you, externally to you, faith. He brings about trust in God, like he did with the centurion, through a word, which isn't even told to us by Matthew, what the centurion had heard, but he trusted. And he does the same now, words attached to means through preaching and water and bread and wine. Or as St. John wrote, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, in whatever we ask, I should say, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. It should be enough to simply hear the word of Jesus and to believe and to trust. But we also know that we are maybe more like Naaman, <laughs> who, having heard the word of the prophet, doubted that word. The word that was powerful and does what it says, dip yourself in the Jordan seven times and you will be healed. Maybe we're like, more like Naaman, weak, in doubt. Maybe we see that word as being weakness itself, and powerless. And because of that, as I've already said, God's loving, merciful kindness 
overflows to us in other ways. Not just simply saying your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus, which is true. But he also then overflows through many means of delivering forgiveness. He gives you brothers and sisters in Christ to also speak that word of forgiveness to you. He doesn't hesitate to show you his forgiveness in all of his means of baptism and Lord's Supper too. We only ask that God would work through all the ways that he's promised, that we would have faith like, like the leper who came to Jesus. Or like the centurion who said, just speak the word and it will be done. And notice again what's in the background of this. Outsiders. Outsiders who shouldn't know, who shouldn't understand, and yet they are the ones who come and plead to the Lord for mercy for themselves and for others. This is how God the Holy Spirit works, though. He works through the means of his word attached to water, bread, and wine. Pastor's voice. To give you what you can't possibly see or feel. To give you trust that you would rest confident that God will give what he has promised. And his promises are the same as they were in the text today. He promises healing for everyone. Either now or in the resurrection of the body to come. He promises that all of our enemies of body and soul will be defeated. Either now, as he delivers us from temptation, but certainly in the resurrection, as Satan and his angels are bound and placed into hell. What we ask for now is that God would heal us and defend us according to his will. And we know that his will has already been accomplished in us, and is his steadfast and sure promise for us on the last day. And again, who is this for? <laughs> well, it's for everyone. It's for the leper. It's for Naaman, a Syrian. It's for a Roman centurion. It's for member and non-member alike, insider and outsider, not us or them. We actually learn quite a bit from these outsiders. We could learn from the example of the Gentile centurion who just confidently asked Jesus, in trust what he needed. Despite who he was, despite what others thought of him, and probably despite what he thought of his own reason and strength. We can also learn from the leper who trusts that, God, that Christ's blood-bought forgiveness would give him healing, either now or as he would show himself to the priests, or certainly in the resurrection. And we could also learn from the paralyzed servant whose friends interceded before him, before the Son of God, and who waited patiently for that healing that God has promised. By all three, we can actually learn, or four, we can learn that we have the same sort of access to Jesus. He has assured us that he hears our prayers and that we can pray confidently knowing that he will provide for all our needs. So let us not cease to pray for everything resting in the confidence of faith that the Spirit has worked in us. May God grant it in the name of Jesus. Amen.